of the man who is thought to have been her husband. You can't tell from just the names. Uh, and with him there were buried some 50 or 65 people. He had been brought in on a wagon with oxen. All of these were in the graves. Now these people were in court at Tyre. The girl harpist who had been playing the harp, her skeleton hands were still on the harp strings, or where the strings had been. And uh, the harp itself was in the form of a bull's body. And the bull's head, a beautiful golden bull's head, had a lapis lazuli beard. This was a mythological bull. This is the bull whose lunar horns we see, the moon bull, who dies and is resurrected, dies and is resurrected. This is the god Tammuz of the old mythological days. Now it is thought that this entire court had gone into the grave as a ritual act. This is only one instance in every one of the ancient cultures, the Egyptian culture, the early Chinese. We have graves with as many as 800 people buried in them. And the dynasties, the pharaohs of the first Egyptian dynasties, had in fact two funereal estates, one in Abydos and one in Memphis. So you would have a country place and a city place with as many as 400 people buried with the king in each one of these. Let us ask, where is the individual in a situation of this sort? There is no such thing. There is only this great law, which in Egyptian was called Mat, in Babylonian, in uh, Sumerian was called Mei, in Chinese is the Tao, in Sanskrit is Dharma. This is a cosmic law that comes from all eternity, permeates the world, and anyone who wishes to be a thing, who wishes really to be something, must live in terms of this cosmic law. And there is to be no individual choice whatsoever. There is no opportunity to think, what would I like to do? What would I like to be? Your birth determines exactly what you are to do. This basic ideal of what I shall now call dharma, of virtue, of a cosmic law to which the individual must submit if he is to be anything, is fundamental in the Orient to this day. And the individual who does not participate in that is said to be asat. He is nothing. He is no thing. Whereas the one who does participate in that is something, sat. The Sanskrit word that has been pronounced sati, where the wife follows her husband into the grave, this is simply the feminine form of the participle sat. She is something. She is a wife because she has fulfilled the wifely role. And when we look back at those graves in Ur, there was a wife. This whole court went following the husband in death. Not only that, but those early kings were themselves killed ritually. Every six years, every eight years, every 12 years, in varying numbers according to the various traditions, the king and his court went into the ground to be dissolved and born again in the next court. It's a fantastic, noble, wonderful ideal, this archaic ideal of the individual who is nobody, but simply the incarnation of a vast, glorious law. Now it is against that that the Occidental ideal of the individual must be measured. And if we look for a date when the first sign of the transformation comes along, we can take the date about 2500 BC, a little later than that, when the texts in the Mesopotamian area begin to distinguish between the man and the god. The king is no longer a god king. The king is the servant of the god. He is called the tenant farmer of the god. The city is the god's estate, and the king is the god's servant there. It is at this point that myths begin to come along of man created by the gods to be God's servant. Man is to be the servant of the god. 
He is not himself a manifestation of the divinity in any sense. God and creature are apart. He is the servant of the God and the God's slave. Now, I want to take a uh, very interesting myth and indicate its appearance in India and in the West and let you see from this how these two worldviews, the worldview of the individual who is no individual but participates in a divine uh, essence and the Western idea of the individual who is separated from the God, how they uh, stand in contrast. To begin with, let me take the Indian myth. In one of the great Indian sacred writings, the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, which dates from about 700 BC, there's the story of the creation of the world. And it runs as follows. In the beginning, the world was only the self. The world was only the self. And the self said to itself, I am. And as soon as it said, I am, it had the concept I, ahang in Sanskrit, ego. As soon as it thought I, it became afraid. Then it reasoned and thought, of whom should I be afraid since there is no one but myself? By this reasoning, fear was eliminated. No sooner was fear eliminated than this being thought, I wish there were another. Now this being was as big as a man and woman embracing, and it split apart and became a man and woman. And the man embraced the woman and begot men. And the woman thought, how can he embrace me when I am of his substance? And she turned into a cow, and he turned into a bull and begot cattle. And this thing went right down the line to the ants. And so all beings were created, poured forth. The Sanskrit word is sushti, poured forth. Creation is a pouring forth of this original being who split in two and became the world. And he looked around and said, I verily am this. It is all I that has become the world. Now, do you remember the counterpart from the Genesis? Do you remember a certain gentleman who was split in half? His name, Adam, to wit, and what Joyce, James Joyce calls the cutlet-sized consort was drawn from his rib. Uh, Adam was split in half and became Adam and Eve, and we are all their progeny. But please notice, in this case, God split Adam apart. You have God and man. The God did not become creation. The God is apart from creation. Man and God are not the same. Creature and created are different from each other. These are two totally different interpretations of the same symbol of the split being that became two and then became all things. Now from this, I want to point to the main ideal for the individual in the great traditions of the Orient. The main ideal is that you should realize that you are a manifestation of that being. That is what you are. It is to be a discovery, a recognition of identity. In the West, the main ideal is that you should discover a relationship to that being, not an identity. This is a quite different religious notion. Now let me go on. The great symbol for us of oriental realization is the figure of the Buddha. The story of the Buddha's realization is uh, extremely illuminating in its psychological nature. The Buddha was seeking to know what the truth of truths is. 
And after the 